Hello, everyone, and welcome back or welcome to another episode of Feeding Curiosity. I'm your host, Eric Wenzel, as always. Feeding Curiosity is about exploring human experience. It is my job to find the tools, tactics, routines, books, or anything else about their experience that all of us can take away from and maybe learn from and apply in our own lives. And on today's episode, we are joined by Ed Lattimore. Ed is a former professional heavyweight boxer, a competitive chess player, and a best-selling author. He is now primarily a writer on his own website. He is primarily a writer on his own website. His writing focuses on self-development, realizing your potential, sobriety, and all of which he approaches from personal experience, overcoming poverty and addiction, and you can find him on his website at edlatimore.com. It is really, really refreshing to have this conversation. It's one that I actually look forward to for quite some time. I actually found Ed through his Instagram, which is highly recommended. And after just seeing his little bits of wisdom through his posts there, I just needed to have a deeper conversation as always. I learned a lot in this conversation. We broadly cover many topics as always from of how we deal with technology evolution and the complexity of technology and then forging yourself into someone who can do difficult things and also putting in the work. A few other categories that we kind of get really deep and into the weeds is Ed has a background in physics and it doesn't apparently come through to as not a forefront of his website but it is in, very apparent in how he thinks and how he talks. It structures his way of thinking and speaking. And we kind of talk about how he taught people calculus and how he thinks about physics. And what that means is you get really, really concise with your ideas and the way you convey information, which I think is incredibly important for almost anyone and everyone. Out further ado, I hope you all enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So please enjoy this conversation with Ed Lattimore. Welcome to another episode of Feeding Curiosity. Ed, thank you for joining on the podcast. Hey, no problem, man. Thank you for having me. It's a Saturday afternoon, Saturday at noon, really morning. So really easy time. I just just use this time like I use most time to write and hone whatever I'm working on. Yeah, I get that. My weekends have lately been a lot of reading and a lot of writing or just kind of, you know, decompressing from the normal Monday through Friday grind. So <laughs> just as a quick preamble for people who might not know you, how do you describe yourself? Because I know you've worn many different hats or have different stages of your life as you explain yourself on your website. I'm sure I'm going to mess this up. But, <laughs> uh, well, what I mean is that I, I, I tend to focus on what I'm thinking about right now and what people tend to to know most about me, like what, what what's part of my identity, I guess, that's built the person I am now. But there's so many other things that people find interesting. But the way I I describe myself is, you know, currently I'm a a writer online and that building that audience has allowed me to focus on things that I'm I'm interested in and really give back. My big book right now is about sobriety, and that's a really important thing to me. And so I I work on that. I used to be a professional heavyweight boxer. I did that for, I was pro for like six years and I had a five-year amateur career before that. And it was a really great and interesting thing. Probably, you know, the thing that really shaped me the most and formed, formed me. And what else? And I really like playing chess, man. So I used to be, (laughs) yeah. So I I used to be a heavyweight boxer and now I'm writing online and I Mm -hmm. like, uh, playing chess. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's one of those things like when I was, I was doing research and trying to figure out, you know, how to formulate questions for what you do. And it's, you know, on the surface, someone could have a really hard time kind of figure out what the through line is between writing and boxing and chess. And then physics also is, is in there. And so the thing that kind of sticks out to me is, it seems like deep focus is like a core strength of what you have, like a superpower. Uh, you know, it's funny, man. I was having a conversation with my, my fiance this morning and I realized that I have really slipped a lot on focus. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, when I, when I had pressures to be focused, I was very focused and now I've kind of uh, got my, let my focus get diluted. 
but I'm bringing it back because I understand that to get to the next level of, of everything that I'm trying to do, I need to have the kind of focus that that let me, uh, what being a being a physics degree, fighting professionally, and and working on a blog all at the same time, and, and do okay. I didn't do do like outstanding, but I think I did the best I could have done, even if I hadn't had the other things going on. And so that's the kind of focus that I, I'm continually trying to cultivate and build up. Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things about like the last two years we've went through, where with everything kind of slowing down with the lockdowns or the various you know measures that were put in place, it, it seems like a lot of that stuff that even though it's maybe not necessary, like to to put pressure on people or to be you know bouncing from meeting to meeting or anything like that, but I still think. Like there's something about stress, right? That, that pushes you to perform. It's almost like being in the military. I have a lot of friends who went to boot camp and things like that and seeing how that stress of boot camp, they'd come back home after they'd finish. And I'd be like, wow, you are like really honed in right now. You know, it's, it reminds me of that kind of like thing. Like you have to keep a whole bunch of things juggling and that kind of fine tunes your, your character, I guess. Absolutely. Because here's the thing that nobody, I don't want to say nobody. <laughs> a few people do. I don't think it's a mainstream idea. Here's a better way to put it. Um, a An idea that is not mainstream and would completely transform society if it was is that, is that stress purifies. It mm -hmm. forces you to remove parts of your self that are not serving you so that you can meet the challenges ahead of you. Yeah. And if you don't put yourself under some type of stress at some point in life, there's no, like you'll never develop. It's just not like like humans. The, the way I always described it, and I heard it, I heard it say, you know, everyone knows like water takes the path of least resistance, right? Yeah. Um, being being like a a physics guy, right? I had to come up with a more general way to state that so it could be applied to everything. And, and I think that all organisms take the most energy efficient configuration. OK, mm. uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to do the least we can do or live with live with the uh, least energy exponential we can uh, to also reach the minimum kind of viable lifestyle. So you have two choices in, in life in this equation. You either want something so badly and you have to work for it to get it, you know, up your energy exponential. Or you sour grape it. You decide that it's not <laughs> worth it. And so you you start to live to what you think is, is optimal. The but but most people I think take the latter route. But the mm -hmm. former, the first, the first path, the only way to do that, man, you have to be under you you have to put yourself under a pressure. Even the pressure of wanting something more yeah. is is a pressure because you, you don't need more. I mean, I, I used to joke and it was a joke. Now it's more serious. <laughs> well, all you really need to be like the man is I, mean, I said this to my buddy who was on a, on dating apps. I said to stand out and be the man. All you need is is a as an apartment. You can have roommates. You, you just got to have your own room, uh, Netflix and and wine and takeout. And this was even before Uber Eats. So it, it's very, the bar is set very low for for basic survival. But if you want more than basic, which is what I, I wanted, you have to put yourself in a crucible and be purified. I think it's a really interesting time when, because of how much more distraction there is in this modern world, you know, all of our technology or all of the, there's just the things that vie for your attention nowadays. It's yeah. like, to me, it was always this thing, you know, I worked in retail before I got into school and, and it was this idea that kind of popped in my head early on was that if you don't figure out what you want to do with your time, something else will tell you what to yep. do with it. <laughs> Man, I always say like, like my, my variation on that, it's like if, if you don't decide what's in your best interest, someone will be, and it won't be in your best interest. It's, it's how I always say it. But like, no, nah, that's one hundred percent true. And and I think people a lot of times look at my life. It's amazing how many times I've been accused of being rich. And I'm like, 
you you got to be kidding me. Now I have more than you, but like what I would consider rich, I'm not even close to that. But what I have is autonomy. I have uh, a fulfilling way. Like, like my results are directly proportional or at least directly related to the effort I put in the world. And that's because I, I went and carved out a section of of the world for myself where I could do this. And then that's the only way you can, I think that's the only way you can really be uh, content. Mm-hmm. And now, if it, if it just so happens that what you, what, 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 what part of the world you carve out, what hobby or craft or skill you develop happens to fall underneath the umbrella of, of being, you know, working for somebody else. I think that's fine too. I don't, I don't have any, I'm not the guy that's going to say, oh, everyone's got to work for themselves to be happy. Like, no, yeah. most people shouldn't work for themselves. But what most people, what everyone should absolutely do is is figure out kind of what's important, where their strengths are, what they're, what they're interested in, their level of ambition, have a real honest conversation with themselves, and then select a path that is going to make them happiest and most fulfilled. Mm-hmm. And try not to focus on efficiency so much as effectiveness. I think there's a big difference, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, when you try to be efficient, you 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 tend to well, well by definition you try to do the least you can and get the most you can. Uh, but but the problem with that is that a lot of a lot of that that's the the level point. That's where like everything is really trying to get to. to yeah. Just stay. If you just put a little more effort in. The results tend to be asymmetrically uh, amplified. It's it's incredible what you're going to do just by working a little harder than you have to. Not that everyone around you, though, that has uh, benefits as well. But but that you then you have to like like you're not in competition and things where you're not in competition with other people. It's just yourself, just doing a little extra little more than you need to, and you get a lot more out of it. And it changes the world, or it changes your world, at least. Yeah. And to me, it's one of those things that, like, we're not designed to think about compounding effects of, of like, small behaviors. <laughs> you know? I always say <laughs> humans are off with the future. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. can think about the future, but we're not good at, like, planning for the future. And yeah. and, and one of the things that always kind of... it. it it doesn't drive me crazy, but it's like, how do we stop these behaviors? You know, like eating healthy or working out more to, to just do those basic things that will have great impact at the, like the longevity aspect of your life. Like, you know, getting rid of those like preconceptions or just those little mental roadblocks that keep people from like committing to something that they, that you can give them all the data for that. Like, that's good. That's a good decision for you to do. <laughs> yep. But you still got to get past the psychology <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I think a lot about this because, and I'm actually working on an essay I need to finish. The The comparison I make, because I look at my life, right, and, and I say my second birthday is December 23rd, 2013. That's when I stopped drinking. That's my second mm-hmm. birthday. There is like, there's like BC and AD. It's, it's, and... And I look at a lot of people I know, most people I know. And if you take a slice of their life, we'll just use my age at Mm -hmm. 37 and a slice of their life at 27, so a 10 year difference and overlay them uh, and measure many metrics, you won't see a difference or even worse, you'll see a deterioration. Uh, and, and, And the analogy I use for this is that most people have it doesn't matter whether you're high velocity or low velocity and the analogy to that is it doesn't matter whether you're you're a high order low order it doesn't matter uh, if if you're in a a a bad place mentally or a good place mentally yeah uh, you so that's high and low velocity your acceleration is zero or in some cases negative and then there are a few people. I have a good friend like this. I got a, I got some good people like this. More people I'm finding I'm finding more and more because of my position on the internet. Um, where if you take two slices of their life, ten years apart, thirty seven and twenty seven, they're like not even the same human, and that and not in a negative way. 
completely improved, added, upgraded further along. So it doesn't matter whether the person was low or high velocity in that case, but their acceleration is positive. It is that they are changing speeds. They are moving up. And sooner or later, you're not even going to, first, you're not going to be able to keep up with them. <laughs> then you're not going to be able to see them. And that's yeah. the difference, I think, between a lot of people and the way, uh, the way they approach kind of living. Some people think it's, we just here to pass time and be happy. And others, I think we embrace it as a challenge. We embrace it as a, as a really a, a forging place, a yeah. proving ground. That's that's the way I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure if you've heard of the book. Um, it's called The Road to Character by David Brooks. I have not heard of that book. So I read that probably late last year. I finished it. Um, and it basically, it's he takes kind of an autobiographical approach to different f- historical figures. Some of them, you know, presidents mm. or writers or people that you would know, like people you would know of them, but maybe you don't know all aspects of the life. Um, and the way he breaks it down is in, I'm paraphrasing, but he kind of, it's a way of, to talk about character building and like, how do you build character? Cause a lot of people think of people nowadays are kind of blank slates is one aspect of that. Or it's like, how do you, how do you become, you know, who you were meant to be, I guess. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like the bad, like when you're younger, you make these mistakes or you have, you know, fractured personalities that don't mesh well. And then over time you kind of figure out how to put those puzzle pieces in the right spot. And I'm trying to think of a new way to kind of talk about this in a more modern sense. And I think character to me is like the forging of a sword, like katanas, because you know, the, the artistry and the craft and the master that goes into forging a sword like that, I think is kind of like what our lives end up looking like. If you, if you take on that challenge to like forge the best version of yourself that you can. Yeah, you know, we are, I, I don't think we're exactly blank slate. Um, I, I just, I, I've seen enough, I don't have kids myself yet, but I, I've seen enough people with kids to know that they have a personality. They, they mm-hmm. come in this way. But uh, we're all trying to kind of converge on this this ideal human. And yeah. we each start out. It's like an RPG, man. That's why I love. Oh, yeah. I, I think about that all the time. <laughs> you know, each character starts with, with a different strength and weakness and ability. But the idea is to hone them all through and develop them to be the best they can uh, through trials, tribulations and, and overcoming those things. And, yeah, when you look at it that way, we're very much taking raw material. Now, your raw materials. Uh, some people have have steel more for hard more. Other people, man, they got clay and they got to figure some out. No matter what, the whole the goal is to forge it and make this thing as strong and as effective as it can be. Mm-hmm. Not efficient because an efficient sword <laughs> is <laughs> is not a sword; it's a gun. You know, <laughs> so, right? I mean. I've I've always been obsessed with this idea of efficiency. Like engineers, we're we're, we're trained to think efficiently, right? Problem yeah. problem solve effectively. But to me, there's also also been like the paradox of like sometimes you had to be inefficient to be to be able to like step out of the current paradigm, whatever the current thinking is. You have to go explore wildly and crazily just to see what's out there. You know, it's like you got to look over the mountain and then bring something back and then you give it to the engineer again and he'll make something amazing out of that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. So I'm, I'm curious about that perspective is when you, when you say that you guys go about trying to form the most, you know, the like, like efficiency is, you know, in general kind of what we're obsessed with when we're constructing things because we, we ideally like to get to no waste, right? Yeah, but that that's never going to happen. I never remember what rule of thermodynamics that is. I think it's the, the first one, but I'm not sure. Uh, the idea is there's always going to be some loss yeah. in in some type in any type of energy transfer, right? And that's what we're doing. Well, we we work. We're transferring our energy to a thing and hopefully making making something happen. Yeah. But like, but but with that whole idea. I think there is this this other idea that, that 
I think we we can't put into science terms, or at least not yet. Right. The, the yes, that path is going to go and and get you there, and that's the fastest way, the best way, whatever. A little further, and you end up with ten x more. I think right. I think making money is like that a lot of times. I think I think a lot of things are like that too. Uh, kind of like it's it's like working out, right? Hey, this is actually yeah. a really great, great like as I think about this. So when you work out, if you try to get your body as as efficient as possible, you'll probably end up somewhere around the fifteen percent body fat range. Like, like it is it, that that's that's not unhealthy. It's just not supremely healthy, and and you're gonna be okay. But if you work out a little more and get to sub fourteen, I'm, I'm speaking as a man. Women have different numbers that I'm not like super familiar with. And yep. get to sub fourteen, the change in your appearance and performance is so much greater. Then it would be just moving from you know eighteen to seventeen or seventeen to sixteen, that fifteen to fourteen, and then fourteen to thirteen, you're really moving and grooving to the point where like like when I was competing, and most top athletes are like this, we tend to sit around twelve percent, yeah, because like we're we are not efficient athlete uh, sports are not an efficient use of your energy. <laughs> But it is a disproportional return, even if you're a little better than average, and you ex- and you expend a little more energy than than you should. Mm-hmm. It's it's one thing that I it reminds me of. So during the pandemic, I was really into the F1 series that was on uh, Netflix. So it's like called Drive to Survive. It's kind of like a oh, documentary. Okay. Yeah, and so they talked about the you know the engineering that goes in these cars, and then also the racers, the, the, the drivers themselves and how they think about their sport. And I kind of like interplay, you know, athletes and all from all dimensions like that, where it's like at, at the highest level, it's the game of like, you know, 0.1%, you know, if you're, if you're 0.1% faster than your opponent, you know, that means you're in your, your case, boxing, your fist connects first yeah. or, or, you know, you're dodging a punch that you saw coming that much or felt coming at that point. <laughs> and it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so to me i th- i think it's fascinating because when i was younger i didn't think sports was anything cerebral or like this like scientific approach to it to me it was just like oh it was it, you're just bigger than the other person or you're just faster and that's just like set points out the box you know and and now that i'm older i'm like yeah that's totally not it like you, that's maybe it gets you in the door but it's yeah not- you know, it's, 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 I, I talked to some guys in the nfl you can actually just you can see these numbers if you uh mm-hmm. whatever I heard them. but like at the at the level of the pro sports everyone is big fast and strong and has ability that's how they got there yeah to the point where even considered what what makes a difference you know what, what sets apart uh, for example, I think it's either Emmett Smith or Barry Sanders. I always forget one of them. Not particularly fast, not not any faster than, than a lot of running backs, mm-hmm. but is something up here. Yeah, that makes it that allows them to play. Right when you get the combination of intelligence and athletic ability, you get guys like uh, Randy Moss and Terrell Owens are the, are the examples I always think about in in sports. You get a guy who is who is not much, okay? Uh, Randy Moss was really fast, right? And tall, but but so was Terrell Owens, and so are most of these guys now. What makes a difference is their intelligence and their and their skill and thinking how they play right. and manipulate certain things. Uh, Tom Brady was talking about Randy Moss that that year the Patriots went uh, mm-hmm. undefeated, and he was saying that. You know, Randy Moss is by far the most intelligent receiver I've ever worked with. And what a, uh, and then step back and think about that compliment for a minute. There are any number of attributes that he has over other players in the NFL. <laughs> and the one that the quarterback, the best quarterback of all time, took note of was his intelligence. And that's what sets him apart. Yeah. To me, it's like intelligence is, is kind of like, um, 
like a processing speed thing. Yeah. And, and I've always thought like athletes or people who perform at a high level in any category, it's, they would have figured out how to perform at any, in any category, you know, you would have you plop a Tom Brady in somewhere else. And if he really cares, he's going to be, you know, in the top five, 10% yep. in anything. And it's like, okay, so what, where, why did, why is that? Right. And there's like, there's something in that that's like, it's not efficiency. It's not, it's not just the, the easy thing we can talk about. Right. If we go back to like working out, everyone wants to know, like, well, what's the fastest way to lose fat? <laughs> right. Uh, right? <laughs> I'm really laughing because like, <laughs> it, it's one of those, but because one, I got, I got a little experience with, with that because, you know, when I stopped training, I, I, I by no means started to look, uh, obese or anything like that, but I have a before and after picture when I because I had to change a lot of habits. When you, for example, when you're fighting, you don't have to think about what you eat. Like when I and, and when you're a heavyweight fighter, I should make that more specific because there's no, uh, way to fight, right? yeah, yeah, you don't have to think about what you eat. In fact, I actually had at one point in my career kind of the opposite problem in that. I was working out and, and eating so well and being so efficient that I was dropping into the 210s and below. That's no good for a heavyweight fighter. Certainly not one that's only six one, right? So wow. so we 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 pulled up and put a little more, but I didn't have to think about this. All mm-hmm. right. And and what happens is you kind of forget, you know, when you're working and burning, you know, I was I must have been burning six, seven thousand calories a day. Yeah, I was gonna say how how many hours were you training like per day? Per week, per week, when it worked out, when we weren't working out for a fight, I was usually in there. Well, I'd say, I'd say a minimum of thirty, and that's and when I say in there, let me, let me rephrase. I was probably in the gym forty hours right. a week. In terms of movement and physical stuff, sparring, running, training, that that works out to in, in non fight prep probably thirty hours a week, right? Yeah, okay. And then when you get in the fight prep, uh. Typically, it doesn't increase much more, but it, it does increase in both time in the gym and training because now you got a you have a specific opponent you're preparing for it. You're trying to peak as opposed to just stay in shape, and so probably thirty five hours. And it and it's not thirty five slouch hours, man. It, it boxing is a <laughs> very in, physically intense sport. Okay, I probably well when I stop fighting. When I went in my last fight, I was 215. When I stopped fighting for a year and I was getting back in shape, finally, I think I got up to like, I was waking up at 230. Wow. Now, now 230 on my frame, my muscle, I was probably, in fact, I'll tell you exactly what I was, like 18%. <laughs> okay. That's not, that, like for me, that's un, like, I didn't like how I looked, you know. Right. So You're fluffy. <laughs> Yeah, we're like fluffy, man. That's a good way to put it. Fluffy. It's not and, bad, but especially if you got muscle, but you know. So so what I started to do, you know, I had to take a whole approach. I had to learn a whole new way of of eating. I had to go from and then with that when I went from one extreme to the other, and now I'm 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 very educated, very balanced. And as long as I and plus I now when I say educated and balanced, I am not comparing myself to the general public. Uh, because my general public at 37 years old, or rather my, my standard for being balanced at 37 years old is, is probably wa- walking around a 14% body fat, which is like, I didn't realize how good that was for the general population. I just yeah. always compare myself to fighters. So I try to stay 14 when I get up, you know, 15 or higher and I go get a scan like once a month. That means I got to make things uh, tighten up. But what I was initially trying to do is I was trying to do it as fast as possible, right? Yeah. People people think when you have some type of of success that you just know what to do. No, you, I stumbled and fell like everybody else. The difference is I, I kept learning. Okay, here's where the slippery spots are. Here's where the holes are. Let me figure it out. And there's no quick way. The quickest way to stay in shape is to not get out of shape in the first place. <laughs> like. That's that's pretty much it. And once you understand that and you realize that there's like no fast way to build something good, but, you know, by the nature of construction and destruction, destruction yeah. tends to happen a lot faster 
then construction, then you go, okay, let me, let me build this up and then maintain. It's like one of the things I always say, you know, uh, Rome wasn't built overnight, but Hiroshima was wiped out in the blink of an eye. That's, yep. that's, if that doesn't sum up the nature of creation and destruction on everything, nothing does. Yeah. I, I love that quote. It's, it's so poignant in like the state of the world to me right now, where it's like, we're so obsessed with trying to deconstruct everything right now and, and, and try to pick everything apart. If you, it's so much easier just to deconstruct something and, and not realize the complexity of the, all the moving parts of that system, right? Like even the simplest thing that we're using every day right now, like this computer to talk to each other, there's so much going on behind the scenes that we didn't have to, (laughs) like so much going on behind the scenes that just makes it work. We just have to click a button and hit record. I don't don't remember where (laughs) I've read this at. I think it might've been a core question. And somebody, you know, posed a thought exercise. If, if you were dropped in like, let, let's say like you had all the knowledge we have today or something mm-hmm. like that, the average person, whatever, uh, and you and you were trying to build a computer from scratch in, in the 19, well, not even like in the 1800s or something like that. Uh, yeah. Or they, they went even further back because there are some certain points. Uh, turn, we'll say turn of the millennium. Yeah. How long would it take you to do it? And the person went on, and, the, and the, the great answer went on to explain, well, first, uh, you, you'd have to, you know, the, there'd have to be a certain chemistry. You'd have to get to a certain point where we, where we understand, you know, how current is creating and how to do that. And then, you know, we're not even talking about the power generation systems and how to move electricity. Oh, and then there's this idea of a clean room and being able to create these tiny microchips that do all this stuff. And don't forget the transistor wasn't invented until like nine to nineteen fifties. And without yep. a transistor, you're working with vacuum tubes. So forget a laptop or even anything <laughs> that can fit in you know in your living room. in a warehouse. <laughs> yeah, that's the warehouse, right? <laughs> well, I think what is that? Carnac, like the first computer was like it was a warehouse. Basically, and, yeah. And we're writing on punch cards or it was mechanical levers and stuff like that. So, so you, and then, then you're going to have really smart guys come along like Alan Turing and, and, and I hope that they don't send them to the front lines of a war. People forget like, how I mean, all those guys could have gone to world war two and not come back and we lose them forever. Oh yeah. And then, you know, forget that. Let's go back even further. We could have lost, uh, Isaac Newton. To the plague, you know everyone. I don't. A lot of people yeah. don't know this story, but it's one of my one of my favorites. Is that Isaac Newton? His miracle year it was 1666. I think he was 23 when he figured out the principles of mechanics, the principles of optics, and and okay, they they say Leibniz also have figured yeah. out calculus at the same time. But you know who's really keeping count? Even even if you're in the conversation of who's figuring out calculus first, you're you're, you're up there. And all of that <laughs> stuff makes a difference. But Newton could have died in that play. Yeah. It just happened to be, you know, from a wealthy family. They were like, ah, we're going to bring you home from, I think it was Cambridge, Oxford, one of those uh, big universities, uh, the old ones in England. And, and we forget how much stuff, not just stuff, had to come together to make our lives possible, but the timing and the benefit. Of that, oh yeah, and, and being able to recreate that circumstance, those serendipitous circumstances, you know, like it, yeah. it is just a a big old deal, and and I never forget, like like this is why you know I sometimes this is gonna sound weird. <laughs> sometimes I stand outside or when I'm on walks, I just stop and I look when I see a plane go overhead. I I'm like that is effing amazing. We got that big ass thing. Like, like when you show somebody like the Wright brothers and what they were flying in Kitty Hawk, you're like, oh, yeah. Hey, I can see how that thing could get into the air, right? Like, it's not a conceptual leap. But then when you try to throw, have you ever tried to pick up, like, like do an arm curl with a hundred pound dumbbell? Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. I don't care how strong you are. That is difficult. All right. So, so you have that idea, okay, a hundred pounds is hard to move and it doesn't float and it, and it sinks immediately when you put it in water on this stuff, right? And then you think about the principles that had to come into play to get this giant machine in the air for 
10 hours, 12 hours at a time. Oh, yeah. And feed you <laughs> and give you the internet while you're up there. Like, there's so much, like, like we really are. I wish people understood this. I had a post about this. Well, it, yeah, I tried to put a post. I wish people understood. We are so we're living in ironically. Times. <laughs> you're, you're you're probably talking to someone who's who knows this this like idea more than probably most people because I work actually in uh, certification and testing and inspection. So I've done product testing on parts that go into all those aircrafts. And and I'm basically make sure that they're not going to fail or fall out of the sky before they ever go to uh, <laughs> production, basically. And so the FFA, FAA gets involved, and we have to make sure that we're following, you know, crossing the T and dotting I's. It's not glamorous work, but it's work that saves. And it has to be the done. Yeah, and and I, every time I, I'm in a plane now. I'll look out, you know, I try to sit by the window just because that's who I am. I like looking out the window and, and just kind of imagining, you know, perspective is everything. Right. And I, I really enjoy looking down out the window and being like, wow, we really are small. And, and, <laughs> and that might sound weird to people, but I'm a big believer in stoic philosophy. So that's another reason I, I want to reach out to you. Um, but I always think of this, this like crazy thought of like, how did, you know, basically apes, figure out how to <laughs> create a giant aluminum tube that rides on explosions <laughs> and it doesn't fall out of the sky. And everyone just <laughs> believed like everyone's just cool with it. <laughs> and then when it lands, everyone claps and gives it a round of applause. Sometimes I remember those days when, we used to clap <laughs> when the plane landed, you know, but, but on that thought process, one of the things that I find, I, okay. So, so for me, I can understand how we get to certain points from certain points, right? Like, right. I can understand how we get to, or at the very least, I can conceive, perhaps not understand the intricacies, of course, but I can conceive how we go from kites flying to putting people in these little fly to gliders to the mechanized gliders, basically with the Ray Brothers flu to like, yeah, you know, high speed. A, stealth jets or these commercial planes are <laughs> and and I can understand how we get from from gunpowder to to bombs right things like that but well yep. certain things like the first principles that blows my mind like I don't under like like what a human figured out what was the process that led them to go I need to apply fire to this so it doesn't kill me like right in terms of meat I was thinking about that I was cooking the other day I was like I get every other part of cooking through trial and error. Like, like you figure out certain things you shouldn't eat because mm -hmm. they kill you, right? But to make the leap to go, because no other animal cooks their food. So we are unique in that regard that if we had been watching our, 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 our surroundings, we would go, oh, that's an interesting thing. Um, let me try it. It would just keep killing you, but there's nothing to show. Oh, let me put it on fire. And I don't that's what I <laughs> After fire, I understand spicing things up, souffle styles, all that, right? Whatever you want to do, right? But that first all that extra stuff fire. is more artistry than than necessity. <laughs> yeah, same with gunpowder. I get everything after gunpowder, but who said, "Yo, gunpowder"? That's where it's at, bro. Like all you got to do, and then I get pushed in a metal thing out because of it. But that controlled <laughs> explosion, you know that that's that strains me, and I just think I think yeah. there's so many mysteries and. And when I think about these mysteries combined with the things that we know that I'll never know or do, but I benefit from, I, I have an incredible reverence and gratitude for being, well, gratitude for being born now and reverence for the collective intelligence of humanity. You know, we, we, we talk about people getting stupid or things being crazy on the internet. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I always end up meeting people that remind me that those are the masses and the masses never moved society forward. Mm -hmm. It was the intelligent individual who, who people recognized and put, put the pieces in play. Every single major invention, you don't think about a major invention or major progress in society, even minor ones, they're not done by the masses They're you know, cause the masses are kind of by definition. Well, not exactly by definition, uh, but certainly by implication, when you remember that intelligence is normally distributed, most of them are, right. are at the very least not smart enough or motivated enough to make any change or dent on society. Mm -hmm. 
Well, just a law. It's just a law of numbers. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, right? Yeah, like, no, the I, law, I, large, law, or law of numbers, not the law of large yeah. ones. But. Yeah, like and to me, I've always thought about that too. It's like, unfortunately, you know, it's like the meat grinder of history. Like, there's more people dead than they've ever been alive today, kind of thing. And it's like, mo- vast majority of those people are, are just forgotten to history for whatever reason. Um, and it's not to say that they didn't make an impact in there, some way. There but just none, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we know of some genetic bottlenecks in our in our past and things like that, but. I always think about this too. It's like being remembered or, or the people who make inventions. I, I, I thought about this recently because I don't know if it's just like a quirk of how fast modern society goes, but it's like, who are the people to aspire to? And, you know, like the easy one is like Elon Musk or, or Steve Jobs, but it's, it's like, there's not as many people who have like those heroic positions in like my time here so far. Uh, or a lot of them ha- who have been around, you know, something comes up that's from their past, and all of a sudden they get a black eye from history. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, and it's, it's a like, weird place that, for that man. It feels really strange to me, and it's like some people like Steve Jobs, but then a lot of people are like, "Well, he was a dick," and I'm like, "Well, if you're that driven and you have a vision for what you want to accomplish in your life, right? You, <laughs> you can't be. This is the heart. Uh, this is you know." One of the, you know how I said earlier, people are bad at the future. Yes. I think the only other thing that people might be worse at and as a whole in the future is understanding trade off, understanding that you can mm. be or have or do anything. You just can't be or have or do everything. So if you have somebody <laughs> that is able to effing revolutionize the way we interact, with the internet and technology, man, he's probably gonna be missing in a few other areas. <laughs> I don't know if you ever, if you, if you read Steve Jobs' bio, this guy. Yes, was, I, 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 I don't read a lot of bios. I started getting into them, but what I find most fascinating is is this guy's reality distortion field, as they called it, and that is responsible for. Like, I'm on a MacBook right now, and I'm not even team Mac. <laughs> I switched to to MacBook. <laughs> because it's just a great machine and it's superior and I will pay that extra money, but it's it's well worth it. And that's responsible. That that's here because of a guy's distortion reality field. He also would be alive if it wasn't for that distortion reality field. Because this this guy thought that he could just, you know, magic not magic away. What's a better way to put it? Holistic away his cancer, right? Yeah. What a simple surgery would have taken care of it. At the, but no, he said, I'm going to do it this way because I everything that I think comes to be. And that's that's a that's a, an interesting trade off. It's like uh, alcoholics. The same yeah. trait that makes somebody an alcoholic. Is the same trait that when you put them in a type in any type of freaking hard grinding endeavor that takes discipline and dedication they they kill it, and then we there's actually like stuff, and I, I only noticed because I'm looking up stuff to throw mm-hmm. into my TED talk to support kind of my idea, and then, and I was looking up the way alcohol works on the dopamine receptors, and it turns out that people who are susceptible to addiction tend to have a have more dopamine receptors and a larger dopamine response than the average person. Okay, that's really interesting. And this is significant because if you're going to work really hard at something, you must see a reward. You must get something out of it, right? Your dopamine has to be triggered. Yeah. Okay. And so if I if I take a person who was going to, you know, revolutionize coding or software, whatever. And, and I and but I instead I give him a crack pipe, and he's got the same dopamine response. He's going to take up that crack pipe hard. Yeah. But if I get him into something else where he has that same response, it it either gets him off the drugs or it keeps him from going there in the first place. And, right. and that's where yeah. those trade offs, man. You, you don't you don't get a, an obsessive creative genius and a balanced person. I mean, it's like, I, I, feel, yeah. I, I, I feel for, I feel for the children of people like, you know, of the hard driving, you know, successful business people, but that's the trade-off. That's right. always been the trade-off. 
It's only now that we think we can have everything because society mm-hmm. is so easy that most of us never encounter real harsh uh, situations where we have to make those decisions on a daily basis. They, we think we can have it all. Yeah, I, I recently heard. So I listen to a lot of like performance psychology. There's a a podcaster and he's the Seattle Seahawks performance head coach or a performance psychologist named Michael Gervais. And one of the things he says that I really agree with is is balance is bullshit. And I don't think he swore, but I'm gonna I'm gonna swear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and because it's like in modern society, we think like because his whole thing is high performers, right? And like, we like to think like, oh, well, you just got to find yourself in balance. It's like, you know, if you're feeling off today, take, take the L for the day, you know, go easy on yourself, you know, have some acceptance or whatever you want. You know, it kind of gets flowery after a while. And I I don't know how much I agree with that because I think, I think suffering in some sense is like necessary. Um, and, and, and some people would probably disagree. But I think like you, you have to do hard things or if you really want to accomplish something at any high level, you have to sacrifice something in your life. You're, you're going to be a lopsided and you might not be all that interesting at the dinner table for a conversation because all you're going to want to talk about is, is your thing. <laughs> is your thing. <laughs> you know, uh, one, of the, one of the hard things that I think every, well, many men have to struggle with is, is they have to decide what is more important? I was listening to a a, a podcaster on YouTube uh, last night called a Man's World podcast, and it's real cool because he's this he's this this brother that like went to prison and got out, and they, I got into him because he was doing breakdowns on a wire. I don't know if you've ever seen the show, great show, mm-hmm. but he was talking about he was talking he had a podcast where he's talking about the trade off between duty and honor. What are you doing then when when you have to choose one. And and the comparison was like, you know, it's it's your it's your duty to raise, you know, your family and to be there for them. Your honor might require you to go and and check somebody for attacking them, and that could land you in prison where you're not capable of of meeting your duty. So that's a, it's a very real, like t- tangible example of uh, yeah. most people to, to, to walk away from duty or honor. And so I think a lot of men have to decide what's more important and there's no right answer, right there. Yeah. But, but whatever answer you select, that is going to determine your choices, you know, and, and another way to look at this, is like you know, is is your responsibility to the world more important than the adherence to your principles, right? Mm-hmm. And, and not often, or I will say, not always, do those things line up. And those instances where they are diametrically opposed, or at the very least, mutually exclusive, you have to decide which one. And that's a hard choice. And <laughs> but that, I think that's yeah. in, in the spirit of what what is allows you to kind of harness your your unique drive that's that's an interesting one you bring up because i think with with the proliferation of things like twitter or instagram or any social media for that matter it it feels like to me is it's easy to like look at a quote or find something that's like oh that's yeah that that resonates with me but it lasts you know five seconds or whatever till the next thing that, you know, hits your dopamine sense, (laughs) dopamine well enough. And then you move on. (laughs) Um, and I always think about like, is like, how do you figure out like who you are? Right. Like what are the things that matter to you? Like what is your value system or, or like maybe even internal philosophy, right? Like for you, I mean, it sounds like you've figured something out (laughs) just from the way you're able to articulate yourself, but it's always a work in progress. So I'm just curious is like, do you have a personal philosophy for yourself? to like articulate your value set? Uh, yeah. You know, I think about, I think about like some of the, the quotes quotes. I hate that. I had to say it that way. Cause I'm really quote myself a lot of times. I'm yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, but, <laughs> but I just, I do that because it's a lot easier when, when it comes to transmitting an idea from your mind to the, to the general world, uh, IE communication, you have to accept that there's going to be some loss and that's what it yeah. communication. Okay. 
I love that I can talk to you like this but because of your background. You understand exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so there's going to be some loss. So what I found is the best way to kind of mitigate this loss is to anticipate it and factor it in. And, and I do this by making sure that, that I, I focus on – it's important to get the idea across in the most simple and generally applicable form, even if that means it's a little imprecise. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think about a lot of the the ideas and I put them in the quotes because that allows people to to get them the easiest and and work with them. Yeah, they might not be exactly right, but that's okay because they're like 90% okay and they're there. Right. It's like, why they they say, like, why did Jesus speak in parables? Well, it's because the message was, it was the easiest way to get the message out so most people can do something. All right. So what with, with that with that all preference or prefaced, uh the ideas that I that I are most important to me, my values. Uh the difficulty is something is irrelevant if it's vital to your success. And and if we dig deeper into that, what I'm basically saying is, you know, your feelings don't matter. I, I really I, I if we're gonna weigh out, you know, mercy versus versus justice. I I tend to lean on justice, but I understand mercy. But but it's from a practical standpoint. It has nothing to do with my right. feelings. I just know that that sometimes the justice response generates a a larger counter response that is you know people get crushed in the second and third order of things because they don't think ahead. Yeah. And so <laughs> that that's t- that tends to be how I think there. Right. So but mm-hmm. but more no matter what, like it's your duty to do what you have to do and and. Worried about how you feel is is weird to me because like like I think about my training and things I've gone through, and and I didn't enjoy training in the sense that it was like oh yeah let's go to the gym and hurt ourselves like it was never fun, <laughs> it was necessary, and so the the right. two exist on different domains and so that's why I say that, uh you know given enough time you can learn anything I, that's a big thing I stress and what I say why I say that. Is is that the people really like we were talking about earlier? People really have a problem investing time. Yeah. But when you un- when you invest time, it's amazing what you can get out of it, and what you can learn, and what you can pull from, and what you can be, and what you can do. Let me tell you a story. You know, I have this article on my website. I took it. I was a terrible math student in high school. I had no confidence in my mathematical abilities. I failed calculus three times. At three different occasions. And then on the fourth try, but you know, a combination of really intending to try and picking up different things from the other three times and being sort something clicked and I never got anything lower than an A in one nice. in, in levels one, two, or three. And the differential equations, I was this close, I got a B, uh, B plus in, in it, but it but it clicked. And what really clicked is I can say it now is you know, oh, I'm just multiplying and dividing, changing quantities and rates. Like, like that. <laughs> if, they, if they ever said it like that, maybe students wouldn't have trouble. But once you understand, it's like the crux of what you're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, then you will. Oh, okay, great. And then if you, and then later you add on changing space as well. Especially when you get to count three uh, and, and changing quantities, count two, uh, but. And you start with like general, well, changing arbitrary quantities is the best way to put it. Right. And then you get to to one where you're working with numbers. But that's just like a simple idea. But I did not, I would not have come to that conclusion if I got calculus on the first try. Or if yeah. I gave up. And it's those simple ideas. Uh, and then that's what really helped me be a, a what I think is an outstanding uh, tutor for calculus and physics to high school students because I understood, okay, if you're here, you're obviously having a problem uh, picking yep. up the subject. Let's figure out what that problem is. Oh, well, you have fallen for the complexity trap. You think this has to be difficult because the yep. teacher wants you to think it's difficult so you feel like you need the teacher. I really believe that in a conspiracy mm-hmm. in school. Uh, That's an interesting, I've never heard that. I like that a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, because a lot of this stuff is simple. Uh, as simple as I'm like, you just need to make sure they understand the correct way to learn. Now, I also learned in my time as a tutor 
that a lot of a lot of these teachers don't know shit. Like, like it's weird. <laughs> like, I, like for example, you'll be able to appreciate this. I hope the general listeners won't be able to too. Uh, I, I was working with a kid who accidentally ended up in a high level physics class. Well, high compared to her levels, she was going on to be a uh, hairdresser. She was already accepted into hairdressing oh, okay. school. And then she, but the, the way the school district works. A principle I mostly agree with, mostly, is that you have to take four years of, of science as well when she ended up in physics. And so we're working with her and it's to save her, her uh, grade. And she she got points taken off on an answer because she gave she only gave two significant figures. And he wanted three. Mm. Now I explain. I'm looking at this, and, and the way I taught her, she did it correctly. So am I like, am I wrong or, or not? So I'm looking, and the answer or the the problem only gave the inputs to two significant figures, like, you know. And, yeah, and, right. So you can't just create a third one, right? You can't make up data. Yeah, <laughs> it, might, it might have been one to two because that seems more reasonable. Point is, you can't right, just yeah. add a a second a, a next significant figure because you're your inputs yeah. aren't that precise, so you can't make them more precise in the future. It doesn't matter if it's seven and three and you get 11, you have to put point one. You don't know, like, because right. you're put right. So when I had that argument with the teacher, I realized that I realized something, and I was like, you know, not everybody is teaching something should be teaching it. And that's like a, 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 yeah. a foundation. So, so, you know, my values, like, you know, how you feel is a, Oh yeah, and I have a big issue with abuse of power. Like, and that's something that I've matured into because that has not always been the case. But, but I, I have a big problem with people using an unfair advantage to, and, and in this in this context, unfair uh, means an advantage that the person could not have. Uh, acquired or merit of their own ability. Uh, yeah. But rather by position, not like genetic or whatever. Right. So, mm-hmm. so you know, bosses taking, taking a vow. I'll just tell you a story. Uh, I had to bite my tongue. Otherwise it would have ruined my whole planet. I was, I was at the commissary. I think, I feel like commissary is the wrong word. Um, whatever it is in, in the army commissary is prison. Uh, <laughs> the, all I can think of is, is the the defect, and I know that, that that's not the right term. But army people mm-hmm. don't know what I'm talking about. Place where you buy stuff, right? Okay, yeah. And and there was a captain, or he was some officer. He might have even just been a, a second lieutenant. Uh, that that used this position to jump in line. Now I'm a private man. I'm not going to win that that argument. Yeah, like not only will I not win that argument, I'm I'm looking at a UCMJ action, like so I got to shut up, but but that kind of stuff bugs me, you know, like fundamentally bugs me when people use their their position or their rank to to control someone in a non professional manner, you know, or rather not related to to their profession, or they use it to take advantage. So so yeah, I got I have a big problem with that. Um in terms of my bias. I'm trying to think, is there any anything else that that really comes to mind that I'm that I don't have any gray area? Because I'm thinking about things I don't have gray area on. Like right, yeah. I have a lot of air things that that I'm I'm nuanced, or at the very least, I can see how you reach that conclusion and did it. That doesn't mean I'm gonna endorse it or let it off the hook, but I can understand how you got there. But right, yeah. But yeah, those those are like the big three, you know. Pretty mm-hmm. much a disciplined, stoic approach, uh, a patient approach, and and not taking advantage of of people because of your your rank or position to them. I really like the way you explain math. For one thing, it's a very quick, you know, easy thing to kind of conceptualize. Because I remember when I was in school and I took calculus, and, and the first time I actually failed it myself too because the teacher I had actually didn't grade homework. So that meant nobody did homework and all he graded was the <laughs> test. And so that meant the test was not the easiest test in the world. Yep. And for whatever reason, it just didn't click. It was so foreign in the form of math for me that I was just like, I don't know what you're trying to ask of me. And then I got, I did it again and I had a new teacher that was way better. Um, 
and kind of walked everybody through and like, all right, we're going to reinvent the wheel here because basically everything you've done up to this point for math has been to get you to this point. And I was like, why didn't anyone tell us this going in? He's <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm like, I would have not just thrown out every unit and just been like, all right, cool. Don't need to know how to do that ever again. <laughs> I think it's just yeah, you know, wrong. That, that, that's funny because I remember I was really fortunate in one of the kids I got to work with because her parents brought me in when she was in the ninth grade and then they kept me up until the 11th grade or rather the conclusion of her 11th grade year. And I also got a summer working with her. And pretty much what we did, we took her from being low performing. Like that's how I ended mm-hmm. up there. Uh, to being the best student in, in both math and physics. And all I did for a lot, especially over the summer where I got to choose what I was going to teach her and work with, mm-hmm. all I did was reinforce the basics, but from a different level. But I had to remind her everything that you're being taught, this is cumulative and builds. You haven't done any other subject like this. This is where this is why kids have so much trouble with math and physics, I believe. Uh, well, and then physics is a little different too, but they have trouble with math because no one is telling them, or they can't even conceptualize the future. There's that future thing again, yep. where <laughs> they're going to need to know without thinking, you know, how to do certain things from the prior level that you do now. Like, for, you know, for something basic. I mean, like, like imagine having. Tr- trying to do calculus if, if you have trouble working with exponents it's going to be a hard right. time like it, 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 that's extra work you're going to have to do that you don't have to think about right yeah now, now you go to physics physics is hard because this is the first time for many students that they cannot regurgitate an answer uh that they have to be able to I say physics force you to to take what you can see and put it in the math and vice versa. Take yep. math and put it in what you can see. Now, t- people tend to have no problem with the last part, taking what they uh, are well, taking the math they see and kind of drawing a picture. But the other way around is a is a is a real pain. It's, yes. a, whole, it's a whole other <laughs> level of of conceptualization that you we're not really yeah. good at, or at least we don't. Or you're not taught. And then and then yeah. you jump into a discipline where that's the only way to do it. Like. Like people yep. think that that physics is about math. Like no, but math is the language so much so that you end up by default in any in any physics program that I've heard of, uh, you get a math minor because you have to yep. take all the like so much math <laughs> to just do the work. And it's not you know it's because they want you to be good math. No, you got to be able to do the work. It's, it's, and then they actually they create uh, my school. They actually found that that people were still kind of lagging. So they created a specific class, mathematical methods and physics, where we explore things that we probably weren't going to cover, at least not in depth enough uh, in our math mm. classes and specifically to how they're going to apply to physics concepts. So I ended up with, with, with so much effing math, man, that like uh, if I was really bad at math, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But instead, right. what, I, what I ended up, I didn't let myself believe that. I said, I'm going yeah. to figure this out. <laughs> no matter how long it takes. And fortunately, but I think that's I'm, a, yeah. I think that's a huge component is that like the self-belief thing. Cause I hear like, you know, being an engineer and, and just telling people that the first thing I always heard was like, Oh, you must be good at math. And I'm like, please like, let's, Put that on the side because it has nothing to do with being an engineer or it has something right. to do like it, but like, it's not like that's maybe the bottom 20%. And then the rest of the engineering stuff is way more hyper specific that anyone could figure out if you just spend time in it. And it's like, I just think people like the earlier your school does a really bad job of preparing students to be able to overcome challenges or adversity. Fix monetization is a motherfucker. <laughs> it, yeah, it exactly. <laughs> And and we really reward that in school. We because one of the big problems with a fixed mindset is is that you don't you're actually stressed out by challenges because you believe either you get it or you don't. Uh, you believe in a smart kid or a dumb kid as opposed to a persistent one and a lazy yeah. one, and that second. That second, like, I guess, framing is so much 
stronger. Like if you were war kids were struggling through a problem, they, they don't do a good job of explaining this in school, but I really believe this is the value of the idea of show your work. Mm-hmm. And Collins did a pretty good job of like going, of, of rewarding us for showing how we arrived at our thought process and more importantly, punishing us if we didn't show, <laughs> even if we got the right outcome. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you because like part of what made it really tangible for me, like like learning math was a language was the way my associates was designed. It was like the lab lecture setup. So, you know, t- on Tuesday, I, we would do lecture stuff and do all the book problems. And then on Thursday, we'd take all that book stuff and the teacher would be like, all right, you're going to build that circuit. And you're going to play with the numbers. You're going to learn about tolerances and you're going to learn about significant figures. But he wouldn't tell us stuff like, you know, these machines, like the digital multimeters would give us, you know, 10 decibels. And I would, for some reason, I just understood it. It like just made, it just clicked for me. And so I'd be helping all the other students because the teacher would leave the lab and like whoever got it would help other people. And then he would come in and check every 15 minutes and I just got it and I'd be like, you guys are getting hung up. He's like, well, the decimals are wrong. Like, and he's looking at like the third decimal. I'm like, it's never going to. It's never going to drive (laughs) yourself. I'm like, you're driving yourself crazy. It's like, it's 10.2 volts. You're good. You're, 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 you know, you've got it. Like, you know, it's funny, man. I was yesterday, I was on a podcast and I was talking about uh, what made me, what would cause my writing to improve. And, and I credit the, the, the biggest jump of my writing skill level wise and clarity and all that right to to the labs i had to do in physics because mm. it was, it was the, the the basic format was one day lecture one day lab and 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 then your lab was due and it, that was the whole semester everywhere was a lab and the lab yep. was really cool because you had to like you know you knew what you were trying to do and you you know you yeah. devised <laughs> an experiment to do that and we would end up converging on different ways to go about it and the math and the software to work it out. And then you had to explain the result and why you believe you got what you get and why. And if it was different or not within range, why you got that. And this whole experience of, of explaining reality, <laughs> my intentions and whether when they went, well, what, 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 right? What, what wrong? What, what, you know, what, what wrong? And explaining all that really made me a better writer. But there's a lot of value in that approach for life in general. People just are afraid to fail. They don't do anything. And like fail, you get the wrong answer. You got to be like, okay, right. what did I do wrong? What can I do right? What can we learn from this? It's a, it's a very different approach to life. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I never actually thought about it like that, but you're totally right because you're always talking about like, what were the errors in your, you know, what are the things you did that could have been errors or what could have been errors on the raw materials you used? And and it, it is true. And it's funny because I, so I'm a big fan of wearable technology. So I'm wearing <laughs> a whoop and aura ring. So I basically oh, yeah, treat I love, myself as aura ring is awesome, man. Yeah. I, I love this technology. It's like, it's really fascinating. And, you know, it's, it's putting more data to things that it's hard to put data to, right? Like instead of, you know, back when I was in high school, people would say, you know, just lift a heavier weight. We'd have the, the weightlifting <laughs> clubs back then. And, and I'm not a big dude at all. I'm like five, five, six. And back then I was like 130 pounds probably. So there's no point. There was no way I was going to be lifting, you know, crazy amount of weight back yeah. then. And so like, it just kind of put, you know, it put a barrier between me and wanting to push myself physically because I was always kind of scientific minded and things like that. It, it just made me not want to go that way. And, and then after, I was 21 and I was just like, you know what? You're going to figure this thing out because I'm sure you would probably have something to say on this, but like I, I, I was listening, it was either to a podcast or a book or something. And I just had this gut feeling of like, the person is a, is a double-edged sword. Like if the mind is strong and the body is weak, like they play off of each other. And like, you can't have, like, if you don't spend any time honing the one, you're, you're sacrificing the other. And so it just, I I don't know where that idea came from, but it's just like, I had this idea that I needed to hone the body if I wanted to keep honing my mind. Cause I'd already been in school and I had like a a summer tech job for my career as I saw it. And I was like, well, there's, I'm like, well, here's the biggest weakness that I currently have that I can see 
that I need to put time into. And like, I needed to fix my diet. I was drinking pop all the time, you know, Coca-Cola and whatnot. Like I just, I just saw myself and like, ironically, like within a month after starting working out, my dad got diagnosed with type two diabetes. And I was like, Oh, there's the universe knocking. You know, <laughs> if I was continued on that path, where would I have been? You know, I'm, that's a long time ago. Now it feels like eight years ago, but like that was like an inflection point in my life that I don't know why I committed so hard, but I just did it <laughs> that way and treated like a science at the end of the day. Yeah, well, uh, my body connection is, I mean, the, that's a, a whole thing to talk about <laughs> uh, because, because people forget it's also body mind connection. And, mm -hmm. and that changes things because typically when we think about mind body connection, we're thinking about, Oh, if you put your mind to it. You can move more than your muscles. Uh, can normally move. That's like the typical image or idea, even if you don't conjure up that exact idea of like the woman lifting the car off of her injured kid or something. Right. Uh, you, you come up with something similar in terms of uh, execution, okay? But it works the other way around too. When you're, but, but it works a little differently, but your body influences your mind. When, when you are at a healthy weight and putting good food in your body and getting good sleep, your mind just works better. It's a it's an organ, right? And it's part of the body. It just happens to be where you know the mind. That's, that's all. Yeah. And when you when you think of it like that, that your mind is an organ fed and nourished by your body, then you go, okay, I need to be strong. I need to be and like, like I need to make sure that I'm I'm not putting garbage into my system. I need to make sure I sleep. I don't drink. Uh, so I don't, I mean, yeah. it's not that I've never drank. Obviously, I'm eight years sober. But you start thinking about alcohol and drugs in that frame as well. Like, how does this influence this up here? Because how this up here works, it's a feedback loop. But the cycle is going to influence my body. I don't yep. sleep. I can't think well. I get frustrated. Then my physical performance continues to suffer making me tired, but I'm not sleeping well. So uh, I'm just, I'm not, I want to still wake up being trained. Like we're the best place compound. <laughs> the best place to start though, you know, because, because the next question is always, well, if the mind influences the body and the body influences the mind, which one should I, I focus on if I'm going to change things? Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of a quote. It's a lot easier to think your or to act yourself into a new way of thinking than it is to think yourself into a new way of acting. So if you take, if you start doing, and then that's just like for the behavior. We're not talking right. about like, like I could, you could change your mindset right now. I have no effing clue. You put on 10 pounds of muscle. I'm going to take notice. Okay. Right. And that's going to change how you are perceived by the world. And that's how you perceive yourself. Okay. If you all of a sudden, if, if, if you, I don't know, man. Decide to start forgiving people, right? And it lowers your cortisol because you're not holding a grudge. That's good. But you know what's even better? If you get your resting heart rate below 60 beats per minute because you're going to sprint, like we can measure that. Yeah. And that is the type of feedback that's going to make it so if you do get stressed, you have a larger buffer before you reach the, the red line zone, you know, for your heart or whatever. Yep. And it's going to make it easier for you to stay in control. It's going to make it easier for you to think through problems. It's going to make it easier for you to do anything that requires thought or emotional discipline when your body is in shape and together. And, and but but you can see the change in your body more quickly. And so the change in your mind starts working because you can change your mind. And I'd be, like it's not going to there, there, there's some research. You still got to move. Uh, it says you can right. think, you know, your way into better skill, but you can't, you know, think your way into into fourteen percent body fat. <laughs> you know? No way. I mean, like, there's you, like thinking only gets you so far, right? Like yeah. thinking is is only so good as the as you act upon it, right? Like how many thoughts that we have all like every day, or you know, that we never act upon, right? And probably most of those are good that we don't act upon those, <laughs> but like. I, I just, to me, it's always like you need to have some sort of action or tangible thing that you do. And, it, you know, maybe it's like this part of the instant gratification where people are saying like, oh, I'm going to start 
I see this all the time on Instagram because of like the, the fit influencer people, but it's like, I'm going to start a detox, you know? And then everyone comments and it's like, Oh, I'm so proud of you. Like <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, Oh, come on. Like, like tell me after you've done it, like show me, like show me before and after then, t- then tell me. Very, Not very like, so. Oh, I need it. That, that's another thing. You know, I have, I have my gray area on it, but I, I tend to, to lean mostly on, on the side of, you don't talk about what you want to do. You just do it. Mm-hmm. You just show it what it done. Because when you talk about what you want to do, um, you you tend to rob yourself of the motivation because you got what you were coming for a lot of times, or at least you got one of the things you were coming for the recognition. Uh, right. On a more insidious note, uh, people are haters, and <laughs> and some of them are like active haters, like they will take your idea or shoot you down if they can. Mm-hmm. So it's just better to show up when it's done, and and really. Things are only yeah. Things are only completed by by physical interaction in the world, and and if you can convince yourself, or not even you can convince yourself, because you know if you did it or not, right? But right. you're you're. I wish I knew the word. But the first thing coming to mind is limbic system, but that doesn't feel right. Uh, internally, you feel like you've done it. You're not yeah. approaching it the same way. If we're talking about that like fulfillment, I guess that dopamine reward system. That feeling of anticipation that drives you, that drives like yeah. the addict, right? You don't have that anymore. You did it, and you and your to your to your uh, neurotransmitters, right? So yeah, it's it's an interesting one, right? Like it's it's like I understand like part of it is like accountability, right? Like once you put something out in the world, it's easy for you to not easy, but you you, you feel like you need to be to show up, right? Um, and I, and I think there is something to that, but it's like certain things like you don't want to say, like put the, it's like putting the cart before the horse yeah. sometimes, you know? And it's like, it's like, it's like saying, for instance, you're like, want to do a marathon or, or an ultra marathon or something. And you're like, you've never done that before. Maybe you can run like a couple miles, but it's like, oh, I'm going to run the marathon and I'm going to, you know, say, I'll run at a certain pace. Like, you're insane. For, <laughs> like, like, and maybe there are some people out there that can do that, like David Goggins, but like, <laughs> like, I just don't like for the average person or for the most of us, you know, I don't know if it, it it's probably not as beneficial to like do that than actually just going and doing it. And then at the end of it, you know, post a picture of the mile time and, yeah, and, and whatever. Then, and then you've done it. It's there. So it's, it's cool, man. That's how, that's how it works. <laughs> we're already over time. I didn't realize <laughs> that we were keeping going. So I'm just going to wrap up with a couple more questions and then uh, we'll call it, call it good. I've really appreciated the time. You just kind of hit the gas and didn't yeah, really, man. Really let up. <laughs> yeah, like, I haven't got something at two, but like, yeah. <laughs> cool. So we've been talking a ton about, like you kind of mentioned stoic philosophy and kind of like negative, like being not negative reactive is kind of what I think about stoic philosophy. Where did that come from for you? Did because you probably got exposed to philosophy like stoicism before you know Ryan Holiday and all this like popularization of stoicism. Yeah, like I, I naturally leaned towards it. I didn't know it was called stoicism. To me, it was just the way to to cope with my life. Man, I had a mm-hmm. my, my mother was was very emotionally volatile, manipulative, and I figured out very early a defense against that was to not let my emotions be. Uh, influence are affected by the world and part of me is like I, that's how i lean that's my my that's my my base character point right is yeah is the non-reactivity and i learned that the being emotional man it, it it no situation is improved when you lose control of your emotions right? yeah i just and so knowing that and knowing the type of area i grew up in with a lot of a lot of characters that could do a lot of damage to you, mm-hmm. I I kept my wits about me and I kept my myself safe in two ways. One, I didn't get in the fights and I didn't have to uh, because I I was running off the mouth of being crazy or talking trash out I'm out of pocket. And also, if I did get to a fight, it was never out of anger. I was, it was out of self defense. It was a very calm method or a calm approach. So that made sure I was much more likely to be the victor and, and escape unscathed. 
Yeah. I, I have to agree with you. I didn't really get into the Stoic system stuff, or at least know it had a fancy name, <laughs> you know, until I was like older and I started listening to other books or podcasts. And I was like, wait, what? Like, that has a name? I'm like, I thought this is just how I think. <laughs> it, it was an interesting one. I always hear it cited from the military, too. I feel like the military kind of trains that demeanor or mindset into people just because of you know yeah got to be cool calm and collected under pressure right <laughs> um <clears throat> we talked about some books but do you have any books you either gifted or recommended to people most often outside i of always own? recommend three books one the art of learning by josh whiteskin i think uh josh whiteskin was a chess master or is he's not dead or anything and then went on to do uh chinese push hands uh, a competitive kind of combat sport and this book is just a lot of it's like a biographical it's like autobiographical but there are a lot of lessons taken did he did he specifically mm-hmm. highlights or shows or or demonstrates in terms of how to improve and how to think about how you think All right so that's my first book a course in miracles which is you know for I'm not even going to get into the, the kind of hokey background or how it would form <laughs> because it is a bit of a hokey story. The, the woman claimed that, that Jesus himself dictated it to her for 11 years by hand. So I'm not, mm. or and told her to write it in those words exactly. Whether that's true or not, with the, the material in the book is, is why I believe in forgiveness how i learned the art of forgiveness and it really changed my life my relationships when i was first exposed to it at 23 uh then i reread it and and now i reference it as i'm thinking about forgiveness and certain ideas it's just a a great book and the last one i've covered the mental i've kind of covered the emotional psychological i guess or spiritual uh lastly physically um the tao of jeet kune do i just actually released my my summary on the book on my website with some some key quotes and ideas and kind of an explanation and an extrapolation on them. And I I enjoy that book because Bruce went and looked at the traditions of the martial arts and he really did discard what didn't work and then explain kind of the ideas and thinking behind the system. Like the Tao Jeet Kune Do, he wrote that while he was recovering from a back injury. It was the last thing he wrote. And and he was explaining what was wrong, how to make it right, how to think about every aspect of, of combat. And there are a lot of really powerful ideas in there that you can take and apply to to all things in the world. Like, like there's an idea he talks about uh, how the, a lot of the Kung Fu forms are just ornamental. They just look good, but how, how useful are they practically? Yeah. And when I read that, that reminded me of something I read about how if you if you strip away the the rituals and the limitations and the requirements to be part of that religion and you focus on the idea that each religion has, they're all the same. It's only when we start introducing these things to differentiate ourselves, these ornamentations that you start seeing a difference between a Jew and a Muslim or a Christian and a Hindi. There's no real difference. We all believe in, in the same basic principles and ideas. Yeah. I like that a lot. It's one of the things I got pretty into like Bruce Lee's philosophy early on when I was like doing, I got really into like calisthenic workouts and things like that. Um, and I remember like the quote, his quote always the, you know, take what is useful and discard what, what, what is not. And I've always thought about that. And, it, and it, it's not just in martial arts. Like you can do that. I think everybody should make their own, you know, Tao of themselves, yeah. you know, taking all the things that they find useful in life. And then the things that aren't, you just discard it. I, I think that's one of the most important things that people get lost on. It, it's, and then those other two books, I've actually read Josh Friction's book. I love that wow. one. Um, the audiobook is really good. Cause he actually did, was the narrator for it. So, there's always something special when, when the author narrates their own oh, no audio. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then the, th- the second one I haven't li- listened to before, so I'll definitely be be diving into that one, and I'll have links in, including the summary that you just mentioned. I'll make sure there's a link to that on the show notes, so people can go find that. I think all three of those are sound incredible, awesome. and 
the the last one or the second last one is if you had a billboard, what would you put on it for people? Oh, that's a could be a quote, could be anything you want to oh, put. Oh yeah, on. you know one, one, one my favorite quote, man. Hey, you know, like <laughs> give it, you can learn anything given enough time, and the difficulty is irrelevant. Uh, if something is irrelevant if it's vital to your success. Nice. I love it. <laughs> and then the last question is like either advice to a young person who like we talked a lot about school and learning and stuff like this one, but either advice to young people who are just getting out of college or, you know, entering the real world, as they say, uh, or if someone who's just pivoting in their life, just looking for a change. And like, what would advice would you give them? You on have that first to step? Man, look, you have to start a website, not not to make money but to host your writing and thoughts about things. Because what I, what I recommended to someone once, and I've seen this work, I don't know if they did it or not. Uh, rather than go back to school for something, um, this is where, how this recommendation came about. I said, don't go back to school. Instead, if you're interested in that topic, make a website and just start putting essays up where you deep dive and study and reflect and, and see how these things apply. Because what that's going to show, for, it's going to do a few things. One, it's going to start networking you. Even if you don't know or consciously try to SEO, it's going to SEO automatically. And when you really get into SEO and it, then you're really going to be connected and found. Second, it's going to work as a billboard. Uh, a billboard and a resume at the same time where it's going to show you grasp the ideas and, and you're passionate about them. Cause, Cause I still don't think most people are doing this. Okay. And, and so, and, and it also forces you to continue to learn. Remember that thing I, that, that, that analogy I gave at the beginning, velocity versus acceleration. That is, that's a key way to show you have a positive acceleration. You didn't just get out of school and stop. You kept learning. You kept growing. You care about the subject. You're passionate. You're sharpening your bond. I think so. So what this comes down to is really uh, take control of your education and your and what you know, your opportunities, and do not rely on the credential to do anything for you. Yeah. The best case, it will. And it'll make you stuck. But most people, it's not going to do a thing. And you're going to be like, why am I not getting the offers I'm, I'm, you know, qualified for? I have this degree. So what? Somebody can actually do it. And they've demonstrated they can do it. How are you competitive? There's a, you know, I, I don't think it's, I, I still don't think this will be mainstream without a big push from companies. And that's cool because the, the few people that get it, they are going to sidestep the whole game. You ever see Ready Player One? Yeah, I love and, that and movie. The very, <laughs> or book, rather. The very the book first is better. <laughs> challenge, how he goes backwards. That is how I look at a lot of stuff like that. That if you go, everyone is trying to do this and it's not working, or are they're, they're, you know, clustering and not really separating themselves. Let's do something completely different. And yeah. then, really, it's going to be in the company's best interest to not make it go. We want to see whose website is this because then that becomes the commodity. No, people, because, because what you want yeah. are people. The only way to test for really useful traits like that is to not let people know they're valuable because if they know they're valuable, that kind of changes why people are doing them. So you don't, you don't weed out the right people. You know, like, like, in other words, the best way to test for ambition is to tell people the best way to do a thing is this way and see what they think. <laughs> kind of like how you, I kind of like how the only way to test for creativity is to give you restraints. You like, you can't, right. yeah. there's no other way. <laughs> right. You need limitation to be able to, to like, all right, all you got is this. Figure yeah. it out. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. I, you know, I think about, you know, it's like, what if I did the opposite, right? If you ask yourself, it's like, okay, what is, what is like everyone look like they're doing? And it's like, okay, now try the opposite thing. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and just think about that. I think that's a great way to like sum that up. It's such a cool, 
it's such a cool thing. And, and like, honestly, part of the reason I have this podcast initially, it wasn't called feeding curiosity. It was just ericwenzel.com. <laughs> and that's what it was. And it was just my honestly, really poorly written things or ideas <laughs> that I, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do with it, but it existed because I, I wanted to skip be better at writing at, at the beginning of it. And it was just like by forcing yourself to do a thing, you naturally just get better, right? Yeah. Putting reps in. You get it. <laughs> like you get it. And most people won't, but that's okay because it's <laughs> like we said, you know, the masses aren't the ones that move the masses forward. The individuals yeah. are the ones that move people forward. They move society as a whole forward. And and those are the people that figured that out. That, those are the people who who go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to learn how to teach. Like, I used to think that was common. It's not common. People who learn how to code hmm. to a level to get like a six figure job, Cody, they teach themselves that from scratch. That's not common. I used to think it was. <laughs> but, but, and there was an example. There's a perfect example of something that is like, I think, a little more known, like in terms of, uh, if you want to like look at it in terms of uh, uncertain path versus super certain, do this new beer. It's probably, it's just about the very least on the other half, right? It's closer to more certain. Yes, if you can demonstrate and learn these skills and do it, uh, you'll end up with this outcome. And most people will be incredibly dissatisfied with their job and life and income, and they will not make the move because that's a hard move. Yeah. And what did I say? The most energy efficient configuration most people will try to put <laughs> themselves into. Yeah. I love it. I mean, this, this conversation was awesome and I really appreciate you making the time and we could keep talking for many more hours, I'm sure. <laughs> so last thing, where can people connect with you either on the internet or you yeah, know, best man, way to I, just follow along I'm with Ed Lattimore everywhere at Lattimore.com at Lattimore's my handle on Instagram at Lattimore's my handle on Twitter. Uh, so just, just about my web, the, my YouTube channels at Lattimore, you know, so just, just show up, man. And cool. Check it out. I'll have links on the webpage. So easy for everyone. If you need curiosity slash podcasts, find Ed Lattimore and that's where everything will be. And as always, thank you all for listening. And this was a great conversation. Hey, thank you again for having me, man.